In the last video, we looked at a mass on a spring. In the first case, we considered the situation when the mass is in equilibrium, which means that the resultant force F on it is equal to zero. And the position of the mass is X equals zero, or we should say the position of this point of the spring. The mass is assumed to be a point mass. It has no dimensions compared to the length of the spring. Then we saw that if the mass is displaced from its equilibrium position by vector x, then the force on the mass is a negative constant times the displacement vector x, which means that the resultant force is in a direction that is opposite to x, because if we multiply vector x by a negative scalar, we get a vector f whose direction is opposite to that of x. So here I have shown the mass below its equilibrium position. So we said that directions downwards are negative and directions upwards are positive. So here x will be a negative vector, but we have a negative scalar by a negative vector giving us a positive resultant force. That is, the resultant force is pointing upwards. Here is the situation where the mass is above its equilibrium position. In this case, vector x is positive. It's a vector pointing up in the positive direction. So vector f will be negative. Vector f will have to point downwards because f is opposite in direction to x. So here x is positive. Minus k is always negative. k is the spring constant. k is a positive number. It depends on the material that the spring is made out of. So if we stick a minus sign in front of k, we, get, we always get a negative scalar. So we have a negative scalar times a positive vector. That gives us a negative vector. So f is a negative vector, which means that it points downwards. And this makes sense because the mass wants, or the spring, I should say, well, the mass wants to get to, it, get to its equilibrium position, which is at x equals naught. So the force vector is always pointing towards this equilibrium position. So whenever the mass is above the equilibrium position, the force vector is always pointing downwards. And whenever the mass is below the equilibrium position, the force vector is pointing upwards. Now in this video, we want to take a look at the equation f equals minus kx and try to solve it. So in other words, we're going to try to find x as a function of time. We're going to try to find the position of the bottom end of the spring or the mass at any time t. So this will be some function of time. Now I have dropped the arrows from f and x because we're dealing with vectors in one dimension, which means that the, that the sine of f or the sine of x will give us the directions of f or x. By Newton's second law, the resultant force on an object is the mass times the acceleration. So this is the resultant force. It's the mass of the object times its acceleration. Now what is the acceleration? Well, the acceleration is the second derivative of the position x with respect to time. Another way to write this is x double dot. The dots indicate, indicate that we are differentiating with respect to time. So two dots indicate that we're differentiating x twice with respect to time. So we can write this equation like this here. I've just written x double dot for a. This equation is the equation of motion for the mass m. The solution of this differential equation has the form x of t equals a sine omega t plus phi. We use the letter omega for the constant in the solution. That's the coefficient of t. So t is the variable. But a, omega, and phi are constants. They're fixed. Now, to see that this is indeed a solution of this differential equation, we are going to plug this solution into the differential equation. 
and show that it makes sense to have a solution of this form. So to do that, we need to get the second derivative of x with respect to time, d2x dt2, or x double dot. So we will start by getting x dot. Well, that's another way of writing dx dt. So we need to differentiate this sine function. The a is just a constant factor. We leave that out in front. To differentiate the sine function, we use the chain rule. So we start by seeing that the derivative of the sine function is cos. If you look that up, we just copy down this angle again. And by the chain rule, we multiply by the derivative of the angle. So we need to differentiate omega t plus phi with respect to time. Well, if we do that, we get omega because we have a constant times t. If we differentiate a constant times t with respect to t, we just get the constant, just get the number in front of t. If we differentiate phi with respect to t, we get zero, because I said earlier that phi is a constant. We can write this omega in front. This omega is not part of this angle, of course. Now, let's look at the second derivative. This is what we want for the differential equation, for the equation of motion. So we need to differentiate this with respect to time. The a omega is a constant factor. We leave that to one side. And we look at the derivative of the cos function. The derivative of the cos function is minus sine. Then by the chain rule, we differentiate this angle to get omega, just like before. And we bring this omega in front here. So we get omega times omega which is omega squared. So we have minus a omega squared sine omega t plus phi. Notice that the second derivative is a sine function, which means that it's the same type of function as the solution of the differential equation x of t. So you can see why the sine function is indeed a solution, because the second derivative is itself. The second derivative of a sine omega t plus phi is also a sine omega t plus phi. Well, we have this extra constant here, minus omega squared, but that's just a constant. And that's exactly what we want to solve this differential equation. We want a function whose second derivative is a multiple of itself. So the sine function is a valid solution. We could also have used a cos function. We could have said x of t is a cos omega t plus phi, because if we differentiate the cos function twice, we get a cos function. So you can use a sine or a cos function as a solution to the equation of motion. doesn't matter. Now we have everything we need to sub into this differential equation. We have x double dot. Well, x double dot, dot is all we needed, actually. So here's the equation of motion. I've just copied it down again here. So we have m times x double dot, which is this here. So we have m times all of this. That's going to give us minus m a omega squared times sine omega t plus phi. So that's the mx double dot. And that must equal minus k times x. So that's minus k times this here. It's minus k a sine omega t plus phi. So you see we have the same thing on either side of the equal signs. We have a sine function. So we can cancel that from both sides. And we are left with minus ma omega squared equals minus ka. So that tells us something about the relation between m omega and k. We can cancel the a's from both sides of this equation. And, and we can cancel the minus signs. So we're left with m omega squared equals k. So we can see that omega is the square root of k divided by m. So we can get omega in terms of constants that we know. We will normally know the spring constant k, and we will normally know the mass of the object. So we've taken care of this constant. Now the next thing we are going to do is look at some features of this solution. The first feature we are going to consider is the amplitude 
of the motion of mass m. The amplitude is the maximum displacement of the mass from its equilibrium position. So the mass will oscillate up and down about x equals zero indefinitely because we're assuming that there is no friction. So the maximum height or distance the object is from x equals naught is the amplitude. So the mass you can see is above the equilibrium position here but it may continue on to reach some maximum position and that distance turns out to be capital A that's the, this capital A in our solution so we're going to see why that is so now to see why that distance is A we look at the sine function the sine function always lies between minus 1 and plus 1 it doesn't matter what this angle is that's, it's just a fact about the sine function it's also true for the cos function which we could have used instead of sine here actually but I've decided to use sine doesn't matter so that's one observation that's very important the sine of any angle always lies between minus 1 and plus 1 so if we just multiply all of this inequality by a we have a times minus 1 is minus a less than or equal to a times this well now we have just x of t which in turn is less than or equal to a times 1 which is a here is a graph of x of t against time remember now x is on the vertical axis we are more used to seeing it on the horizontal axis of course it's just that x is often used for the displacement of the mass or the position of the mass so you can see that the position of the mass runs from minus a that's the lowest position position that it could have which would be below the equilibrium position this distance here would be a well its position would be negative be negative a because it's below we decided to make um, positions below the equilibrium position negative so it runs from minus a to plus a it's the highest position which I indicated up here it's a sinusoidal function so it's periodic it repeats as expected because the mass is moving up and down it's, the, the motion is periodic um, we could get the position at time t equal naught by plugging naught into this here if we do that we get a sine of phi so this position here would be a sine phi so the initial position does not necessarily have to be equal to a we could set the we, we could set the mass in motion by pulling the mass down and releasing it or pushing it up and releasing it in that case its initial position would be either a or minus a but we can set the timer at any time after that we don't have to set the mass off when its position is plus a or minus a um, so it depends on phi if we make phi equal to pi over 2 then a sine phi will actually be equal to a because the sine of pi over 2 is 1 so we can adjust the value of phi for the initial time and the in initial time is arbitrary of course or I should say the initial position of the mass is arbitrary in the next video we will look at a particular example of a sinusoidal function in other words we will give values to a omega and phi we will look at a graph and uh, we will see the meaning of omega